Okay, so now we're going to make this connection between the sine of the second derivative and concavity of the function. So let's just remind ourselves with this. So concave up, or in other words, the function is opening upwards. We saw that at all these points where it's concave up, the second derivative is positive, And all these points where it's concave down, the second derivative is negative. Now, in order to rigorously make this connection here, I haven't really said what it means for a function to open upwards. In other words, what it means to be concave up. I've sort of captured your imagination with it through one example. But let's be a little bit more rigorous as to what we mean by a function being concave up. Well, what it means to be concave up means that at any point along the curve of this orange portion of the curve, we see that the graph of the function is sitting above the tangent line. Whereas if I go to the pink portion of the curve, the graph of the function is sitting below the tangent line. And so that's going to be our definition of concavity. If the graph lies above its tangent lines on an interval, then we say it's concave up. If it lies below, it's concave down. Now with this definition, we can make the connection between the second derivative and concavity. And we're going to do that just with a few different pictures here. So I'm going to look at the possible different cases. We're going to have a function that's increasing. How could it be increasing? Well, it could be increasing like this, sort of in a concave up way, or it could be increasing like this, in a concave down way. Of course, it could certainly be a straight line, an increasing straight line, in which case the second derivative will be zero, and um, it's not very interesting for, for this particular analysis. So we'll just look at these particular cases where the curve is bending. So we've got concave up and concave down. So how do we make this connection with the second derivative? Well, let's look at what's happening here. We've got slopes of tangent lines as we move along here. So what do we notice about these slopes of the tangent lines? Well, the derivatives, which are the slopes of the tangent lines, they are increasing in value. The tangent lines are getting steeper and steeper. So f prime is increasing. What does it mean to be increasing? Well, it means the derivative of it would be positive. The derivative of the derivative is the second derivative, so f double prime is positive. And so that means concave up is precisely happening when the second derivative is positive. So there's our connection. Second derivative is the rate of change in the first derivative, or the rate of change in the slopes of the tangent lines. Those tangent lines are getting steeper and steeper, so the derivative is increasing. That means the second derivative is positive. What about concave down? Well, in these cases, little slopes of our tangent lines as we move along the curve. What are the slopes of our tangent lines doing? In other words, what's the derivative doing? The derivative is decreasing. And that means that f prime is negative. So we have that it's concave down precisely when the second derivative is negative. Okay, in the next case to consider, and let's see if these things still hold in the case where we've got a decreasing function. So what could a function look like when it's decreasing? Well, it could decrease like this, or it could decrease like this. When it's decreasing in this way, all of our tangent lines, so little, little tangent line segments here, they all sit below the curve. So this is an example of a piece of a concave up curve. And we want to see that this is giving us precisely that the second derivative is negative. So let's see that that's the case. What are our tangent line slopes doing? Well, they're starting out as being quite large neg in the negative and mellowing out, getting glowing, clo uh, leveling off closer and closer, maybe going to zero. So it's starting out as a big negative and then becoming a negative number closer to zero. So in other words, the slopes are increasing. Be like negative 10, negative 5, negative 2, negative 1. Those are increasing numbers. So the second derivative is positive, and therefore it's concave up again precisely when the second derivative is positive. So again, even in the case where it's decreasing, we still have this connection of concavity with the sign of the second derivative. And what about in the case where it's decreasing and concave? down, the tangent lines are all sitting above the curve, so it's concave down here. 
I'd like to say then that that's equivalent to the case where the second derivative is going to be negative. Let's make sure that's the case. So what's the sign of our second derivative here? Well, in this case, we see that the first derivative is decreasing, becoming more and more negative. So f double prime is negative, and therefore it's concave down when f double prime is negative. Okay, so all of these things are in agreement with each other, whether the function is increasing or decreasing. So this connection between the second derivative and concavity is now summarized in what's known as the concavity test. It says that if the second derivative is positive, the graph is concave up. So it looks like a piece of a curve uh, like that. If the second derivative is negative, then it's concave down. So it looks like a portion of a curve shaped like this. Now there's a really nice way to remember the connection between the second derivative and concavity. And the memory trick is as follows. Look at your second derivative, in particular look at the sign of the second derivative. What does that tell you about concavity? Well, we've already seen that if the second derivative is positive, this is part A, then it's concave up. Makes a little smiley face. If the second derivative is negative, then it's concave down. So it makes a little frowny face. It's a really nice memory trick. Sign of the second derivative, and the concavity. So when it's concave up when the second derivative is positive, concave down when the second derivative is negative. It's a really nice memory trick to remember this. So I want to introduce one more piece of terminology, and this is known as an inflection point. And the idea behind an inflection point is as follows. Let's take a step back and look at local extrema. So what's happening at a local place of a local extrema? Well, the function goes from increasing to decreasing. Or in other words, the derivative goes from positive to negative, in which case it's the local max. Or the derivative can go from negative to positive, in which case it's the local min. So a change in the sign of the derivative is an indication of a local extrema. Now let's take this to the next level. What about a change in the sign of the second derivative? Well, this indicates a change in concavity. And those changes in concavity are what we call inflection points. So for example, if the second derivative went from negative, you now it's concave down, to positive, concave up. So this was concave down, this was concave up. This is a place where the second derivative is negative. This is a place where the second derivative is positive. The place where that switch happened, where the second derivative changed from being negative over to being positive, is an inflection point. Okay, so whenever you have a change in concavity, going from concave down to concave up, or concave up to concave down, whenever this is changing in concavity, that's known as an inflection point. Okay. And the, the last thing I want to bring up in terms of these tests are back to our original discussion, both classifying critical points as either local max or local min. So you know, the first derivative test, just look at the sign of the derivative to the left and to the right, determine whether the function is increasing to the left and decreasing to the right, or decreasing then increasing. That'll tell you information about whether it's a local max or local min. But we also saw that the second derivative could tell us information about whether there's a local max or local min. This is the second derivative test. It says if you're staring at a critical number coming from the fact that the derivative is zero, and the second derivative is positive, well, that means the function has to look like this. It's got to be concave up. And therefore, it has to have a local min there. So it's got to be concave up, and therefore a local min. On the other hand, if the second derivative is negative, it's got to be concave down. And therefore, that's a local max. So whereas the first derivative test says look on either side of the critical number and check the sign of the first derivative, the second derivative says, look, test says look exactly at the point corresponding to the critical number and find this value of the second derivative there. If it's positive, it's a local min. If it's negative, it's a local max. So it says look at the point. First derivative says, test says look to either side of the point. Second derivative test says look at the point. There's only one slight problem with the second derivative test. It doesn't tell us what to do in the possible third case where the second derivative is zero. And the reason it doesn't tell us is because we can't decide just on that information alone. So note if f double prime of c is zero, then we can't decide if 
it is a local, or if f has, I should really say, if f has a local max or min at c. We can't decide that. We'll need to do another test. What's the other test? Well, I'll just go back to the first derivative test. Then use the first derivative test. Just go back to the first derivative test. The first derivative test will always work for telling us whether something's a local max or local min at the critical number. I have a local max or local min there. Second derivative test works when the second derivative is non-zero at the critical number, but in the case where the second derivative is zero at the critical number, it doesn't tell us anything, so we go back to the first derivative test. Now, why is it not able to tell us anything? Well, we just have to come up with a couple of examples where we have a second derivative of zero, but it could have a local max, or it could have a local min, or it could have neither. And so let's just look at a few examples here. The first example we'll come up with is y equals x cubed. Where's the critical number? Well, it's where the, deriv it's where the derivative is 0. Where's the derivative of 0? That's going to be right here at 0, 0. So we've got a critical number, or a critical point in this case. A critical point is 0, 0. What's the second derivative there? Well, the first derivative is 3x squared. The second derivative is 6x. So the second derivative at 0 is 0. So there's a case where the second derivative is 0, and there was neither a local max nor a local min there. So no local extrema is happening there. So there's no local extrema there. What's another example? Well, let's look at the function y equals x to the fourth. Again, the place, a critical number is 0, 0, so that's our critical number. It's a place where the derivative is 0. What's our second derivative there? Well, f prime of x is 4x cubed. f double prime of x is 12x squared. So f double prime at 0 is 0. So again, there's a place where the second derivative is 0. However, in this case, there is a local minimum at that critical number. So we've got two examples here. Both of them have the second derivative being 0 at the critical number. One of them has a local min. One of them has neither a local min nor a local max. You flip this y equals x to the fourth over, and you get another example, yet that one has a local max there. So you flip it right over. Look at y equals negative x to the fourth. Flip it over, now it's got a local max, still the second derivative of 0. So what this tells us between these examples is that just knowing the second derivative of 0 at the critical point tells you nothing about classifying that local extrema as a max, min, or neither. You have to go back to the first derivative test. And notice in either of these cases, the first derivative test will work just, just fine. The function's increasing to the left, it's increasing to the right, so it has to have neither a local max nor a local min there. It's decreasing to the left, increasing to the right, so it has to have a local minimum there. So the first derivative test works perfectly well. Um, when the second derivative test does work, it's one less step to do. We only have to check the second derivative at a point. So it is useful to know it. Um, when it does work, it, it works quite well, but there are cases where it doesn't work, so you just have to resort to the first derivative test.